Um, so the, the goal of this session really is to um, talk about what's next in the, uh, in the area of human space exploration. Um, it will be an international endeavor, so you'll have an international flavor to, to, to all the talks. Um, you know, building on the success of the ISS partnership. The ISS partnership represents a, a collaboration of space agencies, NASA and Russia and Japan and Europe and Canada, and, and it's really a, a reflection that our human space flight programs today are, are intertwined. We, we don't have much going on outside of, of our partnership together, and so we talk about uh, how to build on the, that strong partnership and explore uh, beyond low Earth orbit together. And so we're going to talk a little bit uh, in this panel about what to expect, um, especially focusing in on the international partnership aspect. So I will give you a sense of what space agencies that have that are intending to partner have uh, have been talking about over the last several years, and how we've laid the foundations for the partnerships that will make uh, human space exploration both sustainable and affordable. Um, ESA's Bernard Huppenbach will talk about uh, ESA's hot off the press exploration strategy and how it fits into the international context. Mary Lynn Dittmar will talk about the most recent NRC report on human spaceflight and, and give us some insight into their deliberations on the significance of international partnerships. And, and lastly, you know, in planning the next steps for human exploration, um, we've all been mindful of the critical importance to ensure that, that these investments, these missions, deliver benefits to, to, uh, uh, to people on Earth. Um, it's not about the fact that we want to build stuff and go places, it's really about benefiting people on Earth. And so two main components of the value proposition for human spaceflight are, are using the unique capabilities of humans to acquire new knowledge and achieve high priority science objectives. And another is the inspirational aspect that humans can uniquely bring to the exploration endeavor. So we'll round out the session with Jeff Plesha providing his perspective on what humans in cislunar space and on the surface of the moon can bring to achieving uh, high priority science goals. So let's get started. Uh, so what's up with the global exploration roadmap? Uh, or the GER, as we like to, to call it. Um, so let me ask in the audience, um, how many people are familiar with the document, especially my new friends from uh, the University of Illinois? Okay, thanks. So the, the, the GER um, is, uh, so well, that's, well, I'll, I will give you an overview of it in, in this short talk, but um, together with my, my co-chair, Bernard Hufenbach from ESA, I have been leading the GER effort within the International Space Exploration Coordination Group since we started the discussions in 2010, about the time that Constellation was canceled. Um, the ISEG, it, we call it, International Space Exploration Coordination Group, is a space agency forum designed to promote coordination of human and robotic exploration efforts to solar system destinations that humans may someday live and work, like asteroids, moon, and Mars. Agencies agree that the best way to promote this collaboration is to have a roadmap, a common roadmap. So we each have our own strategies, so you'll hear a little bit about that today, but we have a common roadmap that, that guides us. So in building this roadmap, we've talked about the best, we've talked about our goals and objectives, strategies, conceptual architectures, the importance of leveraging our investments, and, and, uh, and, and we've reached a consensus which is reflected in this document that you'll learn a little bit more about. So NASA considers the ISEG to be a, uh, a very effective coordination forum for engaging not only our existing partners, but, but new space agencies. Um, and we have contributed a significant amount of resources to ISEG and its products. You know, as the biggest investor in space exploration, um, NASA has a lot of expertise to bring to bear. We have shared our exploration studies over the past decades. Um, we've used our analysis skills and techniques to um, elaborate concepts and strategies. Um, and, and our commitment to SLS and Orion demonstrate a commitment to human space exploration, and it makes us, uh, puts us in the best place to lead in these discussions. That said, we've appreciated the real collaborative nature of the discussions in ISEG. It's, ISEG is a, uh, NASA doesn't lead it, it's a, it's a collaborative uh, uh, organization, and, and good ideas and insights have come from all agencies that have participated. So this is the cover shot of the Global Exploration Roadmap. It is a human space exploration roadmap. It's a roadmap that take that, that concludes with humans on the surface of Mars, not just to plant a flag, but to send people from many nations uh, over uh, in many missions over time. You heard Charlie and, and Greg Williams yesterday talk about this idea of 
pioneering, but that's embraced in this in this document. We're not going to 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 to, to rush there and say we're we're there. We're going as part of a sustainable, uh, long-term human spaceflight effort. Uh, the GER explains that Mars is the horizon destination, not the ultimate destination. It's just the most challenging one we can imagine how to reach today. So those of you that are interested in Enceladus or or Europa, you know, the idea is l let's let's bound the problem, and, and Mars is a really great uh, great long-term goal. It reflects the fact that we take it as a given, as a given that sustainable exploration will be an international endeavor and necessitate the expertise and capabilities of NASA and our international partners. Uh, and, and so, and it reflects the framework of the discussions we've been having over the last several years. What are our goals and objectives? Do we have compatible goals and objectives? And do we have enough of them in common? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, can we identify a common strategy to meet our individual goals and objectives? The answer is yes. Um, how can we describe that common strategy in a way that, that, that helps us engage our stakeholders to get the funding that we need and, uh, and use the roadmap to bring some convergence to this community which, uh, which uh, is full of good ideas about the next direction of human spaceflight. Uh, so that's what you see when you read the GER. So some elements of the strategy I'll briefly discuss are the fact that it reflects a stepwise approach to Mars, not a direct push to Mars. There are several reasons why we chose a stepwise approach. First, it allows the opportunity for more agencies to develop and demonstrate capabilities to contribute to these Mars missions. Uh, NASA's not going to pay for everything along, uh, that's going to get us to Mars. We don't. We want to go with our partners, and 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 the stepwise approach allows the opportunity for them to demonstrate the capabilities, reliable capabilities, to contribute. The second reason a stepwise approach was chosen is it allows a sustainable cadence of human missions um, that promotes the flight flight safety, adequate workforce, technical competence, and 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 opportunities for public engagement. The third reason we like this stepwise approach is it, it creates more opportunities to build on the human robotic exploration partnership. I'll talk a little bit more about that. And, and lastly, it appears more likely to engender a sustained government commitment across decades when, when progress can be made in phases that are, uh, are defined by defined ob objectives and, and contain measurable um, benefits to stakeholders. So the stepwise approach is very, very key element of the roadmap. Another key element of the roadmap and the strategy is the importance of the ISS and the ongoing role of LEO after the ISS. I'll talk briefly about that. And, and lastly, one of the things we'll, I'll, we'll touch on and I'll touch on briefly is, is that understanding the elements of successful international, what will make these partnerships successful over decades? You know, what will cause our governments to continue to invest over decades? Um, what will it take for nations to invest and maintain that support over the time it takes to get to, to Mars? People always want to know, you know, which partner is going to contribute what, you know, and, and yeah, we want to know that, but, but what I really want to know is have, I want confidence that, that they're in it for the long haul, right? So a, pro, a plan that, you know, Bernard and I are, are leading us to consider those kinds of considerations. Um, you know, how do we, how do we uh, get to contributions that are aligned with individual agencies' lo um, competencies but, but long-term objectives? So this is the GER uh, summary roadmap chart we, we, we use. And you can see right away the, 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 strateg the bounds of the strategy very, very vi vividly. The, the strategy starts with ISS and, and, and the, the, all the things, great things we can do on ISS to prepare for exploration. And it leads us to sustainable human missions to the surface of Mars. Um, Mars, again, is a clear and helpful goal, but it's a long-term goal. Um, rather than a detailed pathway to Mars, it, the GER focuses on things in the near-term horizon, things that we can affect now, uh, and, and those are represented in the three major um, swim lanes here I'll talk briefly about. And it, and it says, hey, the specific architecture of how we're going to get to Mars and exactly when we're going to get to the surface of Mars is left for another day. You know, to inform these near-term planning horizon type activities, we've shared Mars exploration architectures. We know that we're going to have to, and, and there's many ways you can go, you know. There's, there's Mars DRA-5, the NASA architecture, the Evolve of Mars campaign, various uh, architectures over the years, some performed by ESA, by Russia, by Italy. There's a number of architectures, and, and they all have common elements, you know. We need to get the crew off the surface of Earth. We need to keep them alive and, and productive on the way to Mars. We need to enter into Mars atmosphere and land. We need to do meaningful things on the surface of Mars for a year. 
need to get them off the surface and bring them safely home. And, and all of those capabilities are things that we can demonstrate in, in the, the near-term missions. And, and, and so we feel like investments that are we're, we're recommending in the near-term missions are going to play forward to Mars um, because the functions are, are, are the same. So the, 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 um, the, uh, the GER has a, has a pathway, you know, to give Mary Lynn a, a nod, you know, it, it, it has a pathway. Lunar, a cislunar space, lunar surface, then beyond the Earth-Moon system to the surface of Mars. And asteroids are important. Uh, if, if, astro if, if it, when we succeed in bringing an asteroid back to cislunar space, that is a, a mission in cislunar space. Um, asteroids beyond the Earth-Moon system um, become enabled by the capabilities uh, of the future. So we talk, the ISS, well, what are we doing now in ISS? We're, we're busy making sure we can get the most out of, of, uh, of ISS to prepare for exploration and advance the capabilities. We're also talking about what's the world like after the ISS. We want a vibrant LEO uh, sphere of activity for humans in space and, and uh, a commercially driven uh, LEO. And so how can we use ISS to enable it? That's what the small blue line means. Um, we talk about how to build the integration and, and synergies with human robotic missions. How can we better um, integrate our activities to get the most for both communities over time, the science community and the human community? And, and, and lastly, um, let's start talking about, no kidding, what are we going to do in the 2020 to 2030 time frame? We have Orion and SLS, and what, what, are we, what missions are we talking about? And so the GER has the first step of cislunar space, in cislunar space, and uh, you heard NASA talk about it yesterday uh, the, as a proving ground, but it's a great place to, uh, to make improvements in system reliability, technology, ops techniques, advances before we venture beyond the Earth-Moon systems because of the longer mission durations and the, and the, and the challenges in returning to Earth. So we, we call it the proving ground, and, uh, and, and, and for us it's a, it's a place to gain experience with, with low energy trajectories and orbits and travel that, that will make travel in the solar system more affordable. It's a chance to uh, improve reliability of systems, it's a chance to learn how to live with the mass constraints um, that we, we haven't had to um, really face as a human spaceflight community because of the robust supply chain feeding the ISS. It's a chance to gain experience with in situ resource utilization by looking at water ice on the moon and, and learn how to keep crews healthy and productive in the, in the, um, in the uh, radiation environment. So um, the two kinds of missions in the GER and the cislunar phase are the asteroid redirect mission of NASA and, and another set of missions that are enabled by the deployment of, a, of an evolvable habitat. So longer duration missions by, by crews at this habitat in, uh, in cislunar space, um, probably at a Lagrange point. Uh, and then the next step would be to the surface of the, of the moon. So the lunar, sam lunar surface campaign envisioned in the GER is a limited one. Five missions of probably 30 days to locations of interest to the science community and human spaceflight communities, helping to prepare mo mo excuse me, helping to prepare roles for future Mars missions, but uh, also advance lunar science and, and engage people on Earth um, uh, with humans on, on another world, um, give them a taste of what's to come as we go further um, out into the um, out into the solar system. We envision that the, the commitments to implement the lunar surface missions would come at a later date. Uh, so the GER is a, is, a, is a reflection of agency discussions. It's the second iteration is the one that's, that's uh, out on the street now. You see there, we're planning on an update probably um, uh, no earlier than middle of next year. We want to have a, the most accurate reflection of where agencies are in their discussions. We want to have more definition of, of how we plan to address those three main areas, the ISS challenges, the, the ro human robotic challenges, and the mission plans for, for the missions next decade, and you'll see more detail. Um, it's the same 12 agencies that are involved. The Chinese have joined the effort. They're not very actively involved, but they are, uh, they're starting to figure out what it's all about and, and how, to, how to engage. Um, and, and lastly, I'll, I'll just get off the stage with a, a note that when we release this updated GER, we're going to release a companion white paper that is provisionally called the science white paper right now, but it's a, it's an op it will be a, a document that can help us to describe the opportunities that are created for science by the presence of 
of crew in their infrastructure beyond low Earth orbit. And, uh, and so we hope that it'll be another um, useful product along with the updated GER and securing the, the government support for the missions that we talk about and, we, uh, and we're planning for. So uh, with that uh, stage setting, I'm going to invite Bernard Huffenbach to the, uh, to the podium. Bernard leads the ESA Strategic Planning Office for, for Space Exploration in the Directorate of, of Human Space Flight and Operations at ESA. In this function, he's responsible for supporting ESA-wide strategic planning on, the, uh, uh, on space exploration, which encompasses the definition not only of future exploration mission architectures, um, about the identification of strategic partnerships for ESA. And he has been uh, one of the, uh, the, 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 the driving forces within the ISAG and involved in the multilateral discussions since they began back in, uh, in 2007. So Bernard? So first of all, I'd like to thank Cassie Larini to invite me to this panel. It gives me an opportunity to provide a little bit an international perspective on the value of international coordination for space exploration, particularly the value of the Global Exploration Roadmap. I will primarily speak about the ESA strategy for exploration, and we just published it actually last week. But I will not so much only talk about the strategy, I want to talk about how the work we're doing internationally now since eight years really has been instrumental in enabling us to develop such a strategy. Now, the f so the first important message is, yes, that ESA has an exploration strategy for space exploration, and we have made it public. And I think, to my knowledge, it's the first time that ESA publishes a strategy, a comprehensive strategy on human space and space exploration. Uh, we have worked on this quite intensively throughout 2014, involving our member states, involving our advisory structures. And what's important to mention, it's, it's really an ESA-wide strategy. All stakeholders of ESA are engaged in this, includes, including technology, including science, operations, human spaceflight, and also including our launcher program. And we have essentially used the strategy we, which we finalized with members at the end of last year to develop a resolution on the ESA space exploration strategy, which was endorsed at the last council meeting at ministerial level, uh, which took place end of last year in, 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 in Luxembourg. Um, the strategy really establishes space exploration as a self-standing programmatic domain within ESA, like we have an application domain, we have a science domain, we have a launcher domain, and, and the exploration domain has its relatively unique features. Space exploration is really seen as a program which should be done for the benefit of society as a whole, so while it is very much science-driven and oriented, it should not be solely to the benefit of the scientists. Uh, it is structured about destination. For us, destination really matter. We very strongly embrace the idea of a human robotic partnership. And for us, it's important to exploit synergy. I will come to all these points uh, later. And the way we see our engagement in global exploration is that we engage in international missions which are of strategic interest to Europe. Now, looking at the next decade, starting 2020, we see three, three kind of activity lines where we could engage realistically. One, of course, includes sustained and user-driven exploitation of lower orbit infrastructures beyond, I, beyond uh, 2020. We want to participate in sample return mission returning samples for Moon as well as Mars. And of course, we want to participate in the stepwise extension of the human exploration endeavor. Now, if, if, if we look at these features, um, I think Cassie mentioned it, our international coordination process started actually in 2006 and the first product we developed was a global exploration strategy. Many of these features you see here have already been discussed at that time and I think many of the discussion we had in Europe were really inspired by the intellect intellectual discourse we had for years at international level and that's why today we see quite some consistency in the way we internationally think and talk and communicate about exploration. So when we ask the question, why explore, then we have defined, of course, clear strategic goals for space exploration. But what's, I mean, important here is that the space exploration goals or strategic goals are not per se about exploration. It's more about how exploration creates a value to society. And that we talk about science. Of course, we want to strengthen the European scientific excellence. Uh, we talk about economics. We want to contribute to economic growth and competitiveness. We talk about cooperation, so we want to promote the establishment of global cooperation framework, 
not just as a necessity, but as a benefit in itself. And of course, inspiration is really a key factor, and it's, really, it's certainly not the last factor where you want to stimulate a society and young generation to attract interest for science, for global cooperation, for sustained human presence in space. And again, if we compare this to the global exploration strategy, this strategy had five themes, and the themes are really consistent with the kind of goals which we have iterated with our member states. As I said earlier, for us, destinations really matter. And we have structured our exploration strategy around three destinations, low Earth orbit, moon, and Mars. And we have arrived at this destination in a very simple way. We, we applied some filters, some criteria. We said exploration is about implementing a series of missions, getting sustained access to a destination. It's about sending humans to the surface, and we wanted to include destination which we can reach the next two to three, maybe four decades. It's, of course, about having concrete partnership opportunities, and this destination have to be of att attraction of interest for the science community. Now, when you apply all those filters, there are really not so many destinations in the solar system, and I think that's why we focus on the three destinations. Today, we have programs in place addressing all those destinations. We, of course, we are part of the ISS program, which occupies the LEO destination. We have started a partnership with Russia, where we developed some early exploration products for lunar service exploration, which we want to fly demonstrate by participating in a Russian mission in the 2020 timeframe. And, of course, for Mars, we implement the ExoMars mission in 2016 and 18. All those missions are part of the exploration framework is in ESA. And again, if you look at those destinations, the chart Cassie just showed, I think we are fully consistent with the global exploration roadmap here. Everything ESA does in space exploration, we do through international cooperation. I mean, we do that not only because it's a necessity, because ESA does not have autonomous capabilities, certainly not in human spaceflight. We could have it in robotic, but in human spaceflight, we are relying on our partners. But we see it also as a value, and we very much promote the idea of multilateral global cooperation, building on the ISS, but evolving the ISS partnership to become a bit more flexible and certainly be open to include new partners. We also have defined some very simple criteria of how we want to enter into partnerships. Firstly, in exploration, we want to have long-term partnership, not only for a single mission, but really long-term, where we gradually increase the level of interdependency we want to be seen as a partner of choice because we focus on certain key technologies, key areas where we demonstrate excellence. And we want to occupy critical path roles. We want to have the right degree of interdependency to be sure that we have a robust cooperation. And today we have two clear examples. Of course, we're developing, in the context of an ISS partner today, the service module for the NASA Orion spaceship. And, and that clearly opens the perspective for a sustained cooperation between ESA and NADA in the field of human transportation. We're really looking forward to build on this partner to get and transition this into a real partnership where ESA is investing in the partnership. With Russia, we are working on lunar robotic exploration. As I said earlier, we're developing some products for the first landing system in the field of communication, sample handling, precision landing which are all critical to the success of the Russian missions. And that's what I mean with interdependency. We want to play a role which is, which is essential for achieving the mission objective to ensure we have a robust cooperation scenario. And again, just to say, that's fully consistent with the GR because the GR recognizes the need for partners to become more interdependent to realize the more ambitious, the more complex mission scenarios of the future. Also, we see that for exploration, we need to go beyond human spaceflight. We need to go beyond science-driven robotic exploration and really talk about a comprehensive human robotic partnership. And what really entails is that future mission really should include robotic and human elements as an integral part of a mission architecture, and both elements together enable a particular mission. Of course, also today we recognize that many robotic missions are precursor for human scenarios, the infrastructure itself of human exploration creates new opportunities for science. And again, we talked about human robotic partnership as early as 2006 when we developed the global exploration strategy. The last version of the global exploration roadmap recognizes that there are some innovative mission scenarios which, which you can only accomplish through a human robotic partnership principle. And it also recognizes the value of getting the communities for exploration and science talking to each other and coordinating their plans. 
Now, exploration for us is all about missions on one hand and transportation on the other hand. Missions, of course, is what creates visibility to space exploration. It's through missions that you get return on your investments and you, you address the, the, the interests of the various communities, in particular science. But when you look at the investment, then you see that most of the investment, certainly when it, you talk about human exploration, have to be made in the field of transportation. Now we looked into the future decade uh, beyond uh, 2020 to see what are the missions which are really aligned with strategic interest of ESA, which are realistic, where we have concrete opportunities in which we want to engage. And when we look to LEO, then of course we want to uh, continue using LEO post-2020 uh, in a user-driven way, and that means we want to look into participating in extending ISS, but we are also really looking into ways of how we can utilize LEO beyond ISS by utilizing other existing governmental or even private sector platforms. For the moon after our joint mission with Russia, we see three mission types in which we are interested, a fully robotic lunar polar sample return mission, and there are plans in the mid-2020 to potentially realize such a mission. We are very interested in the idea of human assisted lunar service operation, and we are investing some funding in order to try to articulate the kind of mission scenario you could accomplish. And of course, we would like to participate then in human missions to the moon's surface. For Mars, we have today the two ExoMars missions, which we think really paved the way for an engagement and participation in international Mars sample return as a stepping stone to human Mars mission. And building on the cooperation with NASA, we really look for strategic role in human transportation. Now again, all these missions are reflected in the mission scenario of a GR. So again, I think we see a full consistency with the global exploration roadmap. Synergies for us are a key enabler for exploration. Synergies will allow to get more return, more value with the same investment. They will, if we exploit synergy, we can accelerate the exploration process. We can also gradually implement more and more ambitious and complex missions. Now, there, there, there are synergies not just within the programmatic domain of exploration, that means between the missions to different destinations. Synergies at research level, synergies at technology level, at capability evolution level, but important, there are also synergies between exploration and terrestrial application, exploration and science. And we're trying very hard to look at how we can exploit those synergies that we can make a meaningful contribution with the limited investments we have, of course, all of us in particular, we have in Europe. Now again, if you look, if you read the Global Exploration Roadmap, it very much calls for the gradual evolution of capabilities from mission to mission to ensure that gradually we can accomplish a long-term goal of human mass exploration. So again, we see a high degree of s consistency between this and the GR. The strategy also defines clearly the ambition, the roles we want to play in future space exploration. We have defined roles uh, through defining focus areas for our engagement. We have defined our initial priority technologies. From those we derive building blocks we could contribute to international mission architectures. And we also have identified our research priorities. Now if you look at the focus areas, there are six. We talk about robotics. We talk about our interest to be able to handle the end-to-end -end sample acquisition return, return and, and, and management chain. We are interested in habitation. We are interested in transportation and navigation. We want to play a role in operations. And astronauts for us are nothing else than an element of the operations of the missions. And we want to continue user-driven research. Now again, the GR really calls for partners identifying the roles they want to play in a sustainable manner. I think if we want to go beyond uh, making ad hoc partnerships, we need to find a framework where partners can identify roles and maintain playing those roles for the long term in order to increase the overall efficiency. Now if we then take as a summary where we are today, I think international coordination really has gone a long way. We started in 2006 and for eight years we had really intensive dialogue every single week. Uh, there is dialogue between various agencies on different topics in the framework of the International Space Exploration Coordination Group. We have also been, I think, rather productive in the eight years. Today we have a common vision, the global exploration strategy. We have a common long-term plan for how we could implement the vision, the global exploration roadmap, which we really want to update and maintain to make sure it really reflects the actual policy and plans of all agencies. And we have a common approach how we can articulate the value of investing in space exploration. So the two most recent products have both been published in, in end 2013.
Now, now that together really gives us today, I think, a very strong base on which we can start establishing really the partnership we need to take the next step in space exploration. And then as a concluding remark, I mean, ESA today really pursues an independent strategic planning process for space exploration, and that's essential. Each actor will have its own strategic planning process to meet its stakeholder requirements and pol policy goals. But then everything we do to implement this strategy, we do in cooperation. We have to even do in cooperation. And interesting is, since we are talking since eight years to our partners, the strategy we have developed is fully consistent with the international vision articulated in the Global Exploration Roadmap. Now, in Europe, but overall, I think there has been significant effort being spent in strategic planning throughout the last eight years and longer. And we have now a strategy, I think the first time we have a strategy which is long-term comprehensive, and we want to use the strategy to really inform programmatic decision at our council meeting upcoming in 2016 at ministerial level, but even the one beyond and the one beyond. So really we want to take a more long-term view how we inform programmatic decision making in Europe. And we also see that the global exploration roadmap, and as we maintain it, really provides a very solid and strong basis to take, to become a reference of how we further mature the definition of the next common step and the missions we want to implement together. Now, taking all this together, I think it's clear that the next years really open a significant opportunity to build upon all this work and really prepare a smooth transition from ISS to the post-ISS area at multilateral level and of course, for us, I think there are two key enablers among many others, but there are two more programmatic enablers for taking this step. And this is clearly, I think, political leadership and political engagement. We need political leadership in order to engage partners in a global program. And I think that the time today is very different than the time when the ISS program was started, where basically United Nations and uh, United uh, States engaged its partners in a U.S. program in a very short time span. Today, all agencies have their own plans for exploration. There is no need to convince other agencies to invest in exploration. There is a need for leadership to make sure they all integrate and follow a common pathway. And we need, of course, engagement in order to ensure that um, each partner can live up to its capability <coughs> and that at public level we raise it for each partner the investments we need to make this global program a reality. So again, I think considering where we are today, uh, the next years, two, three years, create a significant opportunity to actually exercise this political leadership and engagement. I think many of us hope that we see some progress in the near term to make sure that we can implement together the next steps. Thanks for your attention. Thank you, Bernard. And, and it gives you an idea also of, of similar processes that are ongoing now in, in other, other parts of the world. You know, in Japan, there's, a, there's a, an effort to, to, to support um, ongoing government level decisions on the future of human spaceflight that's informed by the work that we've been doing o over the last, uh, the last several years. And, and, and the work is, uh, is, is pretty rich with with the technical detail uh, and, and an ability to demonstrate that, that th these missions can, can meet our goals and objectives and deliver the benefits that, that, that we talk about to, to society. And, uh, and, and it's, a, it's an agency level initiative um, that, that we are in the process of building the political support for. And, and as Bernard uh, uh, Act very effectively described that political support is 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 going to be essential. So um, next speaker is Mary Lynn Dittmar. Um, Dr. Dittmar is a strategist, communicator, policy expert, providing trusted counsel to executive leaders in government industry and on international teams for more than 20 years. She specializes in public-private partnerships and innovative business models. She's guided defense and aerospace and technology firms to more than $2.7 billion of new business while providing insight into legislative, regu regulatory, and policy processes at both the regional, national, and international level. Um, as, you, as you know, she served on the NRC's Committee on Human Spaceflight, and she's currently a senior policy uh, advisor at the Center for Advancement of Science in Space, the CASIS, and, uh, and we welcome Dr. Dittmar to share with us the, uh, 
the uh, NRC report and its implications of human uh, international partnership. Thank you, Kathy. And thank you to the AAS for the invitation to be here. It's good to see all of you. Let me find my little clicker. Clicker? There it is. Okay. Point it, you guys, point it. Not clicking. That's a laser. Hang on. Yeah, that would help. Okay. Um, I'm going to talk about the NRC Committee on Human Space Flight and the Pathways to Exploration report, which was published uh, in June of 2014. The report itself is 286 pages long, and so when Kathy called me and asked me to do this, she said, can you please not recapitulate the report, just focus on the international aspects of it. So that's what I'm going to do. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the report just so you sort of have some of the background for it. Um, the study was actually requested by Congress in the, in the NASA 2010 Authorization Act. Um, the committee addressed a multi-part, multidisciplinary task statement. I originally had slides that captured all the task statement, but they go on for about three pages, and so I skipped it for you. And that was in small font, okay? So I actually skipped it for you. Um, uh, the committee was actually comprised of about 15 people that sat on the committee. There was also a technical panel that was engaged in sort of doing a great deal of technical analysis. And then there was a public outreach panel and um, survey panel basically that uh, did a lot of work, did a survey that sort of reached out to stakeholders and gave us inputs from stakeholders with regard to human space flight. We also did a call to the public to submit white papers and we also used Twitter. A Twitter campaign was the first time that the National Academies had ever engaged in a Twitter campaign um, to, to basically get people's inputs on uh, creating a sustainable human spaceflight program, which was the focus of the study. We also had representatives of past and current NASA and international programs, as well as experts from academia and industry all come in and talk to us. So the study itself took about 20 months, 22 months, I guess, from inception to, to end. Um, it was an extremely complex, very intense uh, period of time and produced a very rich uh, report. So primary findings of the report. Um, is that if the United States is to have a human spaceflight exploration program, then it must be worthy of the considerable cost to the nation and the great risk of life. Um, we recommended a stepping stone approach, and again, I'm not going to go into great detail about the pathway approach, but we recommended a series of pathway principles as well as decision rules that would be used to sort of help apply those pathways to planning. <coughs> The basic characteristics of the pathways, however, is that they used a feed-forward technical approach. As I talk, you're going to hear a lot of things here that are in common with the GER report. I promise you we did not um, recapitulate the GER report, although um, the work of ISIC was certainly an input to what we did. However, you're going to see a great many commonalities. We wanted to feed-forward technical development, um, an aggressive pursuit of partnerships, and those partnerships are not just international but commercial as well, and that's to help manage planning costs and developmental risk. Um, Given the expense of any human spaceflight program and the significant risk to crews, um, in our view, okay, if you were going to um, continue a human spaceflight program, you have to meet certain criteria. Those are the criteria that were established with the principles and the decision rules. Um, but also, you need to focus on placing humans on other worlds. So our end result, um, dis uh, sort of conclusions were that sort of uh, free space approach where you're moving from habitat to habitat that's not what this is about, okay? This is about um, putting people on other wor worlds in a sustainable way. Then Mars is the horizon goal. And again, um, almost to quote Kathy, okay, but again, not quoting Kathy, uh, we talked about the horizon goal as the goal that we could foresee, okay? It is not perhaps the end all goal, but certainly for the foreseeable future, it's the horizon goal. Um, the pathway principles themselves, I am just giving you excerpts, okay? Uh, we basically believe, actually we didn't use the word should, however, um, NASA should basically commit to design, maintain, and pursue the execution of an exploration pathway beyond Earth orbit um, toward a horizon goal. One of the things that we were charged to do in the committee was generate enduring questions. And what was meant by enduring questions is what questions can be answered by human spaceflight? Um, what questions really can only be answered by human spaceflight. And the ones that we came up with were how far from Earth can humans go and what can we discover and achieve when we get there. So the idea is that any program that continues for a length of time would be built around these questions or certainly need to engage these questions. Um, want to engage international space agencies early and design 
uh, and development of the pathway on the basis of their ability and, con and willingness to contribute, which you see is consistent with the GER. Define steps along the pathway that foster sustainability and maintain progress on achieving the pathway's long-term goal of reaching the horizon destination, and then seek continuously to engage new partners, um, specifically to solve technical and programmatic challenges. <coughs> Excuse me, I've had this going on for a while here. Um, relevance to international partners, partnerships and the GER, um, the report stresses the need for partnerships, both international and commercial, and also notes the increasing interest in space around the world. Beyond the partnership that's currently involved in the work at ASIC, um, just as an aside, in 2011, I was involved in a large commercial activity that was looking at doing some space work. And at the time, I just did a quick survey of the number of space, of the number of, co of countries in the world, this is 2011, that had space as a line item in their national budgets. And at that time, there were 66. And I looked again recently, and there are 92. So that's from 2011 to 2015, early, 15, early 2015. So a gr growing increase in space and developing space infrastructure and starting to enter the game around the world. Um, recommending early engagement of international space agencies in planning and cost sharing. I'll come back to this one in a minute. Um, we recommended developing path pathways that have profound scientific, cultural, economic, inspirational, or ge geopolitical benefits. And I'm going to come back to this one toward the end, too. But I would just like to point at the benefits of space exploration document that was put together by the um, ISIC. And also talk about value just for a moment. Um, it's not enough to say that we're going to go do flags and footprints. It's not the idea, right? The idea is that you're doing this because you're returning value to society, to the nation. Um, and so what we were trying to do is basically say, you need to develop pathways that in addition to addressing the concerns having to do with feed forward technical capabilities, a reasonable cadence for missions, okay, um, but also have these sorts of characteristics to them. We noted the stabilizing effect of international collaboration on large programs, but we also noted the challenges to maintaining partnerships over decades. Um, and what's meant by that is geopolitics can change, okay? Uh, countries come into space exploration because they're meeting their own needs, right? They're doing it for reasons that have to do with their national interest. They're not doing it because they're altruistic, okay? Um, they're doing it because they're interested in their own strategic interests. And sometimes those interests can shift over time, especially when you start talking about decades, um, as we have learned in very recently over the last 18 months or so, okay? There can be stresses on existing partnerships because of changes in geopolitical configurations. So we made some suggestions about how it is that you can address those things by starting to talk about the kind of communication that's been going on inside the group here that's been working on the GER, um, as well as making sure that what you're opening up is opportunities for people to bring to the table those things that need to address, that they need to address their interests. Oops, I just killed it. Oh, that was good. Technically challenged. Can you guys get me again? I didn't know I could kill it. You didn't really want to hear the rest of the talk, did you? Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, additional recommendations, and I just pulled one, um, that we vigorously pursue opportunities for international and commercial uh, collaborations, and I'm reading this because to make sure I get it right, in order to leverage financial resources and capabilities of other nations and commercial entities. International collaboration would be open to the inclusion of China and potentially other emerging space powers in addition to traditional international partners. Specifically, future collaborations and major new endeavors should seek to incorporate a level of cost sharing that is appropriate to the two partnership that will be necessary to pursue pathways beyond LEO and shared decision making with partners including a detailed analysis in concert with the international partners of the implications of exploration of continuing the ISS past 2024. This is originally 2020 and then as the report was coming out, um, right then is when the administration announced the commitment to extend to 2024. This last bullet, I want to spend time on both these bullets for a moment here. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on budget, okay, but just to have to do it briefly. Um, the, this last bullet here pretty much echoes, Bernard, your last bullet, okay, which had to do with how do you go forward, what's the transition from ISS to post-ISS, whatever that means. Um, what are, when we, we basically did um, budget analysis looking at the current NASA budget, assuming a flatline budget, then we also assumed scenarios where we had increases relatively inflation, and then scenario where we had inflation plus some modest increase on top of inflation. And the fact of the matter is that under a flat budget and even under a budget that increases with inflation, the cost of operating the ISS is about $3 billion a year for the United States, okay, in terms of both the operation of the station and transportation back and forth to the station. 
the longer you go down that path, okay, the higher the stress on planning for beyond low Earth orbit. And it's just a question of you're going to have to put more money into development, you're going to have to put more money into implementation for beyond low Earth orbit programs. And so as the ramping up of that continues, okay, which it needs to do at some point, okay, the longer you continue the ISS, the more stress there is on an overall budget. It's just the math. So the question then becomes, okay, how it is that are you going to manage that and when are you going to manage that? You have to trade that against whatever benefits it is that you're getting from the ISS. Those benefits need to be discussed in an international context and that is really what we're talking about here. So whatever that transition is, whatever that plan is, it's vitally important both for the management of the ISS and that transition but also for going forward, okay, and beyond low Earth orbit that, that those discussions proceed um, a pace, actually, <laughs> um, and, and do so in an international context, and that's really what we were pulling on there. Um, the one above it, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but um, the United States actually carries the, carries the lion's share all right, for, for costs okay, associated with all space exploration. And so when we talk, start talking about cost sharing, what we were really saying is we need to be clear about what that means. Um, the level of cost sharing that other nations will bring to, in particular, beyond the Earth orbit, okay, it's got to be substantial to significantly offset costs. So that's part of why in the report we actually talk about it in terms of international partnerships, but also commercial partnerships, because commercial co partnerships may help you buy down risk if they can do things at lower cost, okay? All of which needs to be proven yet, okay? But that was the idea of seeking partnerships. So as we talk about this, what we realize is it's really, it's a, a, a very complex mix of international and industry partnerships and collaborations that are really gonna be required to go beyond Earth orbit. Um, with regard to moving forward, okay, the International Space Station, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because it's already been talked about twice, okay, but the International Space Station has basically provided the framework for development and strengthening of an international partnership that's been tremendously fruitful, okay, and that is also laying the foundation, okay, for moving forward with beyond Earth orbit, and, and I mentioned already before there is this tension about uh, continuing station past a certain point. Um, International collaboration is a framework for beyond low Earth orbit exploration. Um, the ISIC is actually a network, um, and it's one of the things that we realized. I sat down and read the entire, by, by the way, NRC report over the weekend. I don't get out enough, clearly. <laughs> but I sat down and I reread the entire thing, and it was really interesting to see what jumped out at, it, at me after many months of having put it down and walked away from it. Um, and one of the things that we noted, actually, was that it's actually a network. Um, it's not, it's a, it's a series of relationships among countries, okay, and, and that relationship, those relationships actually have tentacles, okay, that reach out into other sorts of relationships. And so it's formed the basis not only for the development of the GER and the benefits document, but also potentially opening up to other um, groups sort of coming in over a period of time. Um, and that's a really useful thing to have happen, uh, particularly because it allows for technological development and development of operations in a peaceful environment. Um, each agency envisions contributions over time that range from large-scale systems to missions, landers, cargo vehicles, um, and it allows for existing competencies to be strengthened and actually distributed globally. However, um, one of the things that we heard from the international partners who came and spoke to us is that our nations, the United States, is near-term goals for human exploration beyond LEO were not aligned to those of our traditional international partners. Our international traditional partners are focused on going forward for lunar surface operations. So when we start talking about our pathways approach, one of the things that we looked at is we looked at three different pathways. There are many other pathways, I'd like to say. We weren't saying these were the only pathways, but we looked at three. One of them was asteroid to Mars, one of them was moon to Mars, and then one of them was everywhere to Mars. And when we looked at them, one of the strongest arguments, and it was not the only argument that we had for a lunar pathway, okay, one that went to the moon and then on to Mars, was that that's where our international partners want to go. So if we're talking about everything I just said before in terms of needing to rely on partnerships and to leverage those partnerships as well as commercial um, relationships in order to be able to actually go do this, and if you take seriously what I said before about getting people involved early and making decisions sort of in a collaborative way, then the fact that all of your partners want to go to the moon, okay, is something that you need to be paying attention to. Um, relying on the U.S. to assume a leadership role right now, okay, creates tension 
with those differences in thinking about how things need to move forward. Um, the committee found that the pathways uh, that don't include lunar service operations also have a higher development risk across the entirety of the program many decades than those that do. And so while we did not recommend a pathway, we did point out these things, okay? And so I want to make sure that I note them. The other thing I want to note is that the committee found that the prohibition on bilateral collaboration with China, that is the prohibition under which NASA must operate now, okay, is actually left open opportunities that are being filled by other spacefaring nations. And what I mean by that is, as China moves forward with the development of its program, it's opening the doors, all right? It wants to collaborate. That enables other nations to join with China in exploring exactly the kinds of benefits that we've just been talking about, okay? And there is a possibility, all right, over time, if this continues, that China is going to continue to sort of pull those collaborations in its direction. And we don't think this is in the best interest of the United States, and the NRC was very clear about that point, our committee was. Additional considerations, commercial approaches and international collaboration um, will have to greatly exceed previous levels of cost sharing in order to substantially impact budget profiles for various pathways, which is a point I really made before. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the budget today. Um, the report recommended that the NASA continue to seek partnerships of all types in order to advance development and exploration. Um, we made some additional observations. Uh, this was the, um, the ministerial level meeting that occurred here in January of 2014. Um, it was pointed out then by Deputy Secretary of State William Burrs that international collaboration along with um, competition-driven innovation, okay, is key to many of the spaceflight achievements of the past half century, okay, as well as those that will go forward. Um, collaboration requires satisfactions of the core interests and needs of all partners, which I mentioned before. There's noticeable, noticeable proliferation in a number of space during countries that increases opportunities for collaboration, also increases opportunities for competition. So one of the things that we need to think about is how are we going to balance that going forward. Um, nations that are new to space activities will seek partnerships with experienced nations to soften the barriers to entry to space initiatives. So that has some strategic implications. Um, off, definitely provides opportunities for leadership. And international collaboration is thought to provide resilience for long-term large-scale programs. However, reciprocity is a very important source of stability in that regard. And my final thoughts, these are my thoughts, okay? This is not the NRC, I wanna be really clear about that, don't hold them responsible. Okay, um, sustainability will benefit not only from feed-forward technologies, okay, but from self-sustaining activities such as found in commercial markets and in the consensus building power of enlightened self-interest among nations. And what do I mean by that? The focus of the committee was to look at sustainability. What kinds of factors can feed forward to a sustainable human space exploration program? So what you want to do is find not just we want to go do this because it's a neat thing to do, but you want to find forces that actually have their own weight, okay, are sustainable on their own. Um, finding ways to build consensus among nations has implications for a whole lot of other relationships um, and things that different nations might undertake together. So doing human space exploration collaboratively is something that also helps you build your relationships with other nations and other endeavors. And so this is a very important and useful tool. Um, it requires time, vigilance, and constant effort to address these human variables. Kathy mentioned and Bernard mentioned how much time and effort has been involved in the work of the ISIG. This is something that you can't let drop. You have to stay with it. This is really about human beings learning to trust each other, learning to communicate, learning to express their strategic needs and find ways to work together. This is a tremendously difficult endeavor. It is every bit as difficult as the technical endeavor that's involved in going beyond Earth exploration, and it's one that we sometimes miss. Um, the importance of patience in the long view, all right, collaboration beyond Earth orbit. So these are long lead enterprises. We're going to have to be at this for a long time. Um, and realistic expectations of planning are most likely to encourage persistence. So these are just the, this is the title, final title of the report. Okay, this is a link. You can, actually, you can just Google it. Um, okay, and then just a comment up here about myself. So thank you. Um, you know, I want to make a comment about the moon, um, and I think that it is true, it's no secret that, um, that the moon plays a more important role in the strategies and plans of our international partners than, than it does in the United States. Um, but the GER has a, has a pathway that says lunar, cis, lunar vicinity, cislunar space, then surface of the moon. And what we found, uh, what's reflected in the document, and what, what is really true is, is the next step is cislunar space. In cislunar space, you hear 
NASA talk about how we can meet our objectives in this proving ground of, 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 of learning how to live and work beyond low Earth orbit, of, of increasing the reliability of our systems, learning how to live without the supply chain, you know, getting ready to go beyond the Earth-Moon system, building on the, 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 cap the habitation and life support capabilities from ISS to prepare for those missions. Um, this, this phase also for the agencies that want to go to the surface of the moon provides an opportunity to learn about what it means to operate beyond low Earth orbit, to do some of the human robotic partnership integration things, to prepare this habitat as a staging post that would enable the lunar surface mission. So these, there is a, a solid agreement on, on this cislunar phase being a, a valid step in, uh, in, in any direction, and the decision to go to the surface of the moon will come, you know, when it comes. And, and, you know, I think we're heading into an administration transition. People like to talk about, you know, what's going to change. You know, I, I don't think NASA is going to get a big increase in its budget, and nor do we need one, right, in this time frame. I think, you know, the kind of, of, of budget increase that would allow NASA to say, I would then develop the lander creates a lot of problems. It creates, again, another constellation like NASA doing it all uh, program without opportunities for the, for the partners to play these critical roles. So, so these lunar missions are going to be enabled because our partners want to go there, because our partners get the money for landers and surface system capabilities and, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and so that's just where we are. Uh, okay, so now I'd like to uh, invite Bernard back up because um, I, I think that uh, uh, he wants to share some, something uh, very exciting about uh, about the moon. You know, we talk about these missions in the lunar vicinity and the lunar surface. I mean, it's it's it really the moon is right there, right? So uh, let's let's understand what that means. I think it was the last session yesterday, the next generation session, where Bob Roger asked the question at the very end of the students, what is the most inspirational destination? And we only count the single figure, the single hand being raised for the moon. So then afterward I thought maybe that's not really the best question to get a unifying approach to how we explore. Maybe a different question to ask is how can you uh, find the inspirational element of each of any destination? Now you will see a movie where we're trying to make an attempt on either level to tell an inspirational story why the moon we think is still a very interesting destination. Maybe we can show this movie now. It's actually also available on the ESA public website. space exploration. The Ranger missions from the United States took close-up images of the moon before eventually impacting the surface. NASA's survey missions demonstrated a controlled soft landing at the surface of the moon and tested the properties of lunar soil to prepare for future human missions. A series of Soviet landers and rovers visited a number of locations, performing scientific investigations driving across the surface and returning samples to Earth. But the pinnacle of this period of exploration was Apollo, and the arrival of humans at the surface of another solar system body for the first and only time in history. Looking back now though, we see that only a tiny fraction of the moon's surface has been explored. All on the side of the moon that faces the Earth, and in a region close to the equator. We've also discovered that all of the samples we have returned to Earth are from an unusual region with a complex and exotic chemistry of potassium, phosphor, and rare earth elements such as thorium. The vast majority of the moon is yet to be explored, including the entire far side. One thing that we can say for certain is that if we want to understand the moon, then we need to go back there. Now, after decades of waiting, an armada of missions from around the world, including ESA's Smart One, have returned to explore the moon from orbit. Looking down from above, these missions are providing a wealth of new data, bringing a new understanding and raising new questions. They are giving us a global insight 
and preparing for new missions to the surface led by China's Chang'e 3. And the next wave of missions to the surface? Where might they go? The next destination will be unlike anywhere we have been before. The extreme and alien landscape of the near South Pole. Here, we find areas of permanent darkness and extreme cold where water, ice and other chemicals can become trapped. And as we come up from these lowlands, we see towering peaks basking in near constant light. On these polar mountains, the sun rarely sets below the horizon, providing the potential for near continuous solar power and a spectacular view over the rugged and cratered landscape below. In 2009, the El Cross mission blasted water and other chemicals out of a permanently dark crater in the South Polar region, allowing it to be observed by nearby spacecraft for the very first time. We also now know that there are nearby locations with similar cold conditions. Is there water here too? If so, how much is there? Where did it come from? And what can it teach us about the origins of water and life-forming chemistry on Earth? This water may have been delivered by comets and asteroids impacting into the surface over billions of years. It may even have been created at the surface of the moon. We now know that protons thrown out by the sun and the solar wind arrive at the lunar surface. Here, they react with oxygen and minerals to create a thin layer of water. These water molecules can be lifted by the sun's heat before falling again to the surface. Over time, these particles may move to the polar regions where they are trapped by the cold conditions. And as we stand at the pole, with the Earth in view, we can point our antennas to the sky to search for faint signals from deep out in space. But radio noise from the Earth is too loud and blocks out many cosmic radio sources. But as you move over the horizon, the Earth sets out of view. The noise disappears and a new kind of radio sky emerges. We see our galaxy and the planets as never before. And beyond, a quiet radio hum. A signal from the cosmic dark ages more than 13 billion years ago, when the first cosmic structures were formed. And now, beneath us, the moon as we see it today, scarred by craters formed by billions of years of impacts. And the largest and the oldest of these, the South Pole Aitken Basin. Formed by a powerful impact around 4 billion years ago, many believe that its formation marks the start of a dramatic period of bombardment onto the Earth and the Moon, an era called the Cataclysm. This era is recorded on the Moon's scarred surface, and its end coincides with the appearance of the earliest observed traces of life on Earth. In the coming years, we will see explorers at the lunar poles, exploiting the extended sunlight for power and performing research to benefit life on Earth and to understand our place in the universe. This will begin with small robotic missions to understand the environment and prove new technologies to pave the way for the future. We will then move on to increasingly ambitious missions with humans and robots working together, learning to live and work at the surface and performing new and important scientific research. This new exploration will be achieved not in competition as in the past, but through peaceful international cooperation. Eventually, we will see a sustained infrastructure for research and exploration, where humans will live and work for prolonged periods. Here, we will put into practice the lessons of years on the International Space Station to establish a facility akin to those that we see in Antarctica today. 
In the future, the moon can become a place where the nations of the world can come together to understand our common origins, to build a common future, and to share a common journey beyond. A place where we can learn to move onwards into the solar system. And perhaps in the future, at a sun-bathed peak at the lunar south pole, at the edge of a crater, we will learn to access and utilize resources from deep below in the dark. Zooming in, closer and closer, we see water ice molecules trapped in the cold. The source of hydrogen and oxygen, essential for sustaining human life, and for rocket fuel. Fuel to propel us further into the solar system and on to the next destination of our journey into the cosmos. put in context a little bit um, how much of the moon we've actually seen. Uh, this is the Washington Monument, um, and this is the uh, Apollo 12 Traverse uh, to scale. Um, so they landed next to the Washington Monument, walked around the grass for a little bit, never even got to the, uh, the gift shop, and then came home. Um, <laughs> Apollo 17, uh, and, and they were only on the surface for uh, not just about a day. Apollo 17 was the last mission. Um, they had the the capabilities of a, of a rover, um, and, and they were there for three plus days. And so they did a much more extensive uh, traverse. Uh, again, if the, the lander was at the Washington Monument, they forayed down south here towards NASA headquarters and immediately turned around. Um, <laughs> then, then they went up into the northeast here um, and eventually to the south southwest and explored, uh, it's hard to tell from this, but if you knew the geology of the moon, they explored the whole valley. Uh, system and, and, and saw a variety of, of terrain features. So we haven't been very aware. I mean, there's, there are others, there's Apollo uh, 12, um, 14, 15, and 16, but um, 
they, they scaled similarly with this. And so we've actually seen a very small part, part of the moon. Now, wh what do the humans bring to any endeavor, be it something in, in orbit, in cislunar space, or on the surface? I think there's a couple things. One is their unique observational skills. In the case of the Apollo program, um, the astronauts, who, most of whom were test pilots, um, were all trained in geology. Um, some of them did better than others, but, but particularly um, the last one to go was uh, Jack Schmidt, who was in fact a geologist, but Neil Armstrong and um, Dave Scott, Dave Scott particularly, and John Young really got into the geology and, and really absorbed a lot of stuff. And so when they were on the surface, they were able to make really key observations and, and recognize things that were not expected. Um, in the case of Neil, uh, he ran over here to a, a small crater called Little West that was not in the plan, but he thought about the fact that, gee, I'd go look at this crater and, and see what's at the bottom. Um, when, uh, during Apollo 16, John Young s saw this rock and they realized that there was an area that might be permanently shadowed and so they went and got a sample from there. Turns out it wasn't permanently shadowed, but it was an interesting observation. Um, Dave Scott on the way back to the LEM, um, you know, they were pressing on him to get back because they were running out of time and he saw a rock that he thought was really neat and he knew if he said, I see a rock, they're going to say, forget it, get back to the LEM. So he said, oh, my seat belt is stuck, I need to fix it. So while, <laughs> so while uh, Houston thought he was working on a seat belt, he hopped out, ran over and grabbed the sample and it turned out it was a, was a unique sample. Um, similarly, uh, uh, during Apollo 17, uh, one of the more classic ones is Jack Schmidt. When they got to Shorty Crater, he was walking around and, and kicked up the soil and discovered that there was this orange soil there. That was completely unexpected. Um, you know, with, if you have a rover wandering around, you can only look at so many things. Um, if you come across something you never anticipated was there, it's unlikely you will see it because you're not prepared to look at it. But as soon as he saw it, he knew it didn't belong there. And um, so they spent a considerable amount of time here sampling it, trying to understand what it was. And in fact, um, there was a lot of discussion about going back there or staying there longer at the expense of other things, but they finally decided to just sort of keep along with the, the timeline. But in each of these cases, the fact that you had a human there who immediately could recognize something was not, not usual um, is a unique capability of, of a human. Some of it can be reproduced by robots, but not, not always. Um, they're also very dexterous at, at obtaining samples. Uh, in one case, this is Camelot Crater. This is also at Apollo 17. JPL, in, in the most optimistic scenario, would never get near this place with a rover um, because you're not going to be able to get around there. But with a human, you can easily walk through there, collect all these different samples. Um, you, can, you can get up on these boulders, as was done at Apollo 17, and collect a variety of materials that are typically out of reach of rovers. And they're, and they're able to do this because they've got a lot of mobility that, that many robots don't have. Now, there's also, there's also manual dexterity innovation. Um, this is Apollo 12. Um, Alan Bean was trying to get out the nuclear gener power source for the, um, uh, art for the RTG and the, the ALSEP station, and he couldn't get it out. So we asked Pete Conrad to go get a hammer and bang on the nuclear fuel, um, <laughs> which was probably not the, the best idea, but they came up with a strategy to get this thing out and stick it in the RTG and power the... Um, the experiment. If, if, if this had been some automated thing and uh, the, the fuel was stuck, that would have been the end of the experiment. Um, similarly, um, one, of the, one of the better examples is uh, Gene and Jack's body shop. The fender came off the rover and so they were getting coated with dust and so the question was, what do we do? Well, much to my dismay, they took a geologic map and, and made a fender out of it, but, but that solved the problem. And, and so. They had, they had the ability to look at a problem and come up with a solution. And there are lots of examples, particularly on Apollo 13, um, when they were in trouble, they came up with a whole lot of creative solutions uh, to, to save the crew. So, so the humans have a, a whole bunch of, of unique capabilities in terms of their, their observational skills and, and what they can do um, by themselves. Some of the Apollo program, they spent a lot of time doing stuff that was just manual labor that, that could be done by a robot. In this case, here's Buzz Aldrin. Uh, dragging the ALSEP out away from the, uh, the LEM to put it down. Um, one of the things, this was a scientific experiment, but Jack Schmidt is reading a gravity meter. This is something you can automate. You don't need a human to do this. As uh, Mary Lynn said before, and as, as Charlie Bolden alluded to yesterday, using humans is expensive and it's dangerous. So you want to put them in a position where you're, you're maximizing their use and, and the, the cost and danger of using them is worth the return. Um, this is, in, in these particular cases, while they're always going to be manual labor and if they're there they can do it, um, you wouldn't want to design a program where this is the kind of stuff they spent um, 
most of their time on. You'd want to have them out sampling uh, and doing things where they're critical to, to making progress. Okay, so what can you do in cislunar space? Um, this is a little vague at the moment because we really don't understand exactly where we would go. Um, there are a couple of Lagrange points you could use, one of which is L1, which is between the Earth and the Moon, so you could, look at the, you could set up an observatory to look at the Earth, you could set up an observatory to look at the near side of the Moon. Um, if you were to go to L2, which is on the far side of the Moon, you could look at the far side of the Moon, but you could also, um, in the context of, of one of the things from the video where you could do radio observations, you're on the far side of the room, you're far side of the moon, you're partially shielded from the Earth, and so you can look out into the, the, the galaxy both optically and, and with all spectrum and, and make observations there. Um, you can also do, uh, if, if there are robotic systems on the surface, you can operate them or monitor them. Um, in some cases, this could just as easily be done from Earth, but there are aspects of, of proximity and higher data rate, and um, you can, in some sense, make some observations from from those positions to help guide the, the robot that you wouldn't be able to do from the Earth. So there's, there are opportunities here to do science and there are opportunities here for experience, uh, but, but this is a little vaguely defined at the moment, so it's hard to, to quantify this. And one of the things Kathy and I were talking about was, was providing a little more specificity to what this might look like in order to understand what the, what the human role in terms of science might be. Um, for the surface, there's one point I wanted to make, and, and, and you know, people show pictures like this and say, oh, I'm going to drive a rover around like this and stuff, but it, you need to put this in context. This is the south pole of the moon. This is a radar picture from the Earth. The south pole is here. This is Shackleton Crater, um, and, and below this, uh, this is 20 kilometers for scale. These are the traverses that, have, that are sort of record setters. This is Opportunity. Opportunity's been operating on, on Mars for a decade. It's managed to get 40 kilometers. Um, the Apollo programs went a few kilometers. Uh, Lunacods 1 and 2 went, went farther distances. But these are very small distances compared to a picture like this. Okay? And, and if you've got humans and you've, you've got to work on a schedule, they have to sleep, um, and you've got things to do, you know, you're not going to wander around this whole area in the course of, of 30 days or something. So your, your objectives have to be focused. The place you go has to be focused such that you get maximize the, the return scientifically. Depending upon what your objectives are um, programmatically or technically uh, will also drive where you go. Um, if you were to do a short duration surface mission, and, and I don't know whether they're all the same length or whether they're going to vary, but, but you can imagine something akin to a, a, a enhanced Apollo where you spent uh, a considerably longer period of time than they did, but you're, you're relatively limited. I mean, even in 30 days, you're not going to get very far from, uh, from the lander, and so you want to focus your science experiments, one of which uh, could be a study of the regolith, where you look at the, 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 the stratigraphy of the regolith, because the regolith holds a record of the, the solar history uh, as well as the lunar history, and so that could be an excellent way to, to, uh, to do some science. You could dig some trenches. This is a view across the uh, Hadley Rill, and basically there's a surface regolith that's currently forming. There's a layer of basalt here. Um, underneath it may be another regolith layer, and so you'd want to sample this, because this records a very brief period of time, three and a half billion years ago, and, you, and because it's loaded with the particles from the sun as well as the galactic cosmic rays, you can get a record of what was going on then that we don't have anymore now on the Earth. And so you would trench into the regolith and, and, and collect samples, and you could carefully map out the, the details or trigger of the regolith and carefully sample. If you had a long duration mission where you're going to spend maybe more than 30 days, um, again, this is the South Pole, and, and the point of the circle is this is 100 kilometers, which would be very hard to, to, to cover grounds like this um, in a short period of time. But what you want to do is, is look at a much bigger kind of problem, and, and Jim Green alluded to the impact history of the moon yesterday. Um, we really don't understand it very well. Um, there is a suggestion that like at three and a half, 3.9 billion years ago, there was a big increase in the cratering rate. Well, we don't really understand that yet from the samples we have, but if we were able to, to date a lot of craters, get a lot of samples, carefully select those samples with humans, uh, we could confirm whether in fact that, that did occur. So. I think in summary, the, the point of all this is that the humans on the moon and in cislunar space can provide important additions and enhancements to the activity. Um, there's scientific activities in terms of sampling and conducting experiments um, that can be done. Um, but there's a whole lot of things that the humans can be involved with where you use the moon as a test bed. And, and just to illustrate this, this is Jack Schmidt over the course of three days from a nice white suit to something um, completely filthy. Um, 
from the, from the fine-grained part of the regolith. Um, and, and what this illustrates, what they learned over the course of the Apollo missions was that uh, the regolith got into stuff, it became, it's very abrasive, um, but, but over the course of the missions, they learned to deal with it better and better. And so if you, wanted, if you had systems that you were ultimately going to deploy on Mars, you might want to test them out on the moon in a nasty environment um, rather than in, in deep space in some, or, or on an asteroid where you're not really going to um, get the same thing. The moon is, is important because it's low gravity, similar to Mars. It, gravity on Mars would be greater, but it's, it's got gravity, which influences things that you don't have at, in in an orbital situation. Um, it is in a deep space environment. It's outside the Earth's magnetic bubble, so you're, you're exposed to all the environmental effects of deep space. Um, and it's dirty, and it's complex. And that's the important point, is you don't want to try to test out equipment that's going to operate on the surface of the moon or the surface of Mars in some sterile orbital facility. You really got to get down on the surface and understand how, how things work. And I think I'll conclude there. Thanks. It's a, it's a, a two-part question, one part to Bernard, another part to Mary Lynn. Um, picking up on the issue of uh, international collaboration, cooperation for human exploration, of course, scientific exploration is already take, taking place significantly. So um, uh, Bernard, as, as you probably know, uh, we have heard uh, the NASA administrator as recently as yesterday morning be unambiguous uh, about, although NASA may support humans returning to the lunar surface, NASA will not lead. Thus, um, a partner, presumably ESA, Russia, or maybe China, ESA will take on the expense, the technical development, the planning and so on, to go from orbit to, to the surface. So your question for me is, in your judgment, do you believe that ESA, on the time frame of, say, 10, 15 years or so, prepared to do that, to take on that responsibility? And then for Mary Lynn, a, a pair, a, a, sort of an American version, um, the uh, NRC and others have said how important international collaboration and real serious collaboration, even b more beyond what the space station is, will be critical path forward. That's sort of the whole theme of the GER. But as you know, in the US and many of you know, NASA often gets slapped around a fair bit from various sources for having, for example, relied on Russia for returning to the space station with humans, although that has been a years-long plan that NASA has articulated well. So, uh, Bernard. Yeah, thanks for this question. So, does it work? I don't know. Um, of course, the decision on programs is either the decision of the member states, but if I just look at the strategy we have for space exploration, it's clear that when you derive from the strategy potential roles of ESA, ESA playing a role in getting humans down from cislunar space, lunar service, being part of lunar service infrastructure investment would be fully consistent with the strategy. And I think if I look into our current technology priorities, our programmatic environment, we, we would have, uh, I think, from a technical and programmatic programmatic point of view, we could, would have the capability to make significant contribution in principle. Now, I don't really know what it means, uh, neither or you as would not lead. That's a point where I'm not so sure what that actually implies, because how can you lead, uh, not lead such an undertaking if you have the, uh, if you have the, uh, all the transportation capabilities you need to make it happen? So, so while I think um, there could be significant contribution of many partners to make the lunar surface campaign reality, I would still think it needs a fair amount of leadership, and I wouldn't see anybody else able to lead it than the United States. So you are in disagreement with the NASA administrator? No, that's not what I'm saying. No, <laughs> no I would be. <laughs> no, no. You know, I, I think it's the question is it, it's a question of how do you define leadership? Let's put it this way. There we go. Well, I would just agree with everything that was just said there. Uh, the other thing I would say is, uh, to get to your question, which has to do with things, uh, how would you put it, being slapped around, is that how you put it? Um, for, for international collaboration, it's true that the, um, I'll just pick on Congress, and I'm speaking for myself now, let me be crystal clear about this, not for the National Academies or the National Research Council. Um, it's true that, that Congress historically has an ambivalent relationship with international agreements and collaboration, and not just in space. Um, 
geopolitics is a complex art, um, and it has to do with, with strategies that, as I mentioned before, can shift over time. With regard to NASA's collaboration with Russia, as with other nations, there's always a risk when you enter into collaborations. It doesn't make any difference if that risk is in an, if, if it's an international risk or a commercial risk or an industrial risk. I mean, there's always risk when business partners get together, right? So I would say that the practical, the practical truth or reality of this is that if we're going to stay in space, if the United States is, is serious about doing beyond Earth orbit exploration, both the costs, the distances, the technical challenges, okay, and the geopolitical benefits that are associated with moving forward together, I think probably, I would argue, outweigh um, the political winds that blow from moment to moment. There are strengths that come from international collaboration over a long period of time. We talked before about how the international partnership and the ISS has stabilized not just the partnership, but that program. Um, and it has a direct role to play in sustainability for long-term exploration. So NASA may get slapped around, um, and it's nothing to say that it won't happen again, but I think that you just have to take all these things into consideration and try and find a balance that works, and you have to deal with the practical realities. Um, I had, on the uh, subject of the dangers of sending humans into space, I have read somewhere or seen it on television, I don't remember where, but I understand that people are lined up to go to Mars, and that would be a one-way ticket, of course, but uh, as of yesterday, they said that it could be 20, 40 years in the future. You're talking about well into the future, but is that true that people are waiting to go to Mars? Yeah, there's a, um, what is it, Mars, Mars One um, sent out an announcement and, um, you know, hundreds of people applied um, to go and they've whittled it down now to, I don't know, a hundred or so, a hmm? hundred, you know, sort of semi-finalists and, and, you know, th those people are, are signing up, are interested in signing up for, for something that they, you know, is a great adventure and they don't really understand it. I mean, there's, you know, I, I would hope that they would recognize there's a, certain level of danger to it, and that they'd go into it witfully. Um, I mean, there are people who apply every year, every time NASA has a call for astronauts. Um, you know, they, they get many more applicants than they can pick. So it's not, there's no shortage of people who are willing to, uh, to take the risk. Question for, looks like it's on, yeah. Question for Kathy and, and anyone else who wants to chime in. Uh, as we're getting ready to do another international engagement for exploration, would one way to perhaps, would it be best to try to do it differently than ISS? And I'm thinking in this regard, uh, obviously we've got the difficulty the United States is having now with Russia. Uh, we've also had some reticence to do it with uh, China, to get China involved because of some other concerns. Uh, but what I'm wondering is, would a way to, to kind of spread the risk or spread the, the blame, I guess, uh, of, of maybe one, two countries having difficulties, would be instead of having a partnership where they're all together, like you know, each country signs on to, have some sort of an entity, almost like a, like a United Nations for space exploration, where each country just buys into the program, and you're not actually buying into partnering with each individual country one-on-one, -on -one, but buying into the idea of the international cooperative effort. Um. And those ideas have been talked about over over the last years, I would say. Um, and, and in many countries, there's a genuine interest in a, um, a distributing the, you know, a consensus-based um, management approach. Um, and, and I think if we get to the point where there are a number of different uh, countries that have independent access to Beyond Leo, at, destinations, then it, it may be a reality. However, I think that, um, you know, right now we're trying to, to, to get, get enough resources together to, to, um, to, to start the journey, right? And, and I think that um, the technical nature of the endeavor benefits from, uh, from a leader. I think, a, but a leader that leads in a way that is, um, that, that is that is collaborative, and and I th so I think that you know the the way things evolve will 
will evolve based on you know what agencies are prepared to invest. So I think if you think about how would we bring China in, you know, it, ultimately people talk about it, and, um, and, and it's not something we're actively talking about or planning for. But um, but you know you could imagine initial steps um, uh, with them uh, being some sort of coordination of, of two separate programs that's that's coordinated at a. At, at, a, at, at a different level than a specific monolithic exploration program. So um, I, I, again, I think that, that, that in the near term, the, the amount of resources and, and the, the focus being brought to bear is, is about evolving where, we, where we've achieved our, our expertise and our capabilities from ISS. That there's things we can learn from the ISS partnership and, and the, the, the governance model and the, 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 the framework that that are worth carrying forward, and there's others that are specific for a LEO laboratory and don't make sense for exploration. So I don't think anybody's talking about let's, let's adjust the ISS, IGA, and MOU to make this happen. Um, we, we will need another framework, and, 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 and that framework will be decided really by what we want to do and who, who wants to do what, I think. You want to add anything? 